nomination and for screening Charming Augustine for us today. We'll have a chance for you to ask Zoe some questions in a little bit. Warwick. Her primary research area is the cultural history of madness and trauma. Anna has recently published a book with Juliet Foster entitled Performance, Madness, Psychiatry, Isolated Acts, a chapter on Broadmoor Hospital and the Edinburgh Companion to the Critical Medical Humanities and is completing a monograph called Disordered, Madness and Cultural Representation. Alongside her academic work, Anna is a theatre maker with her company, Idiot Child. The company will be touring a new work about fear and anxiety entitled, What if the Plane Falls Out of the Sky, in May and June of this year. Thank you, Anna. Hello. Um, so we're moving to the sort of late 20th century now, but hopefully some overlaps in terms of um, um, ideas of evidence. Um, so upon his committal to Bethlehem Asylum, it's infamously reported that the restoration dramatist Nathaniel Lee remarked, they call me mad and I called them mad and damn them, they outvoted me. Aside from its wit, the retort conveys several themes that cling limpet-like onto the institutional history of psychiatry. The collective faceless power of the professional they the role of language in the social and medical execution of difference, the quivering thresholds of normalcy. And today I'm concerned to examine how artists have figured the asylum, the hospital and the community in order to understand the human and aesthetic meanings of space in mental care contexts and practices. How do environments, bodies and behaviours collide and thereby mutually produce the feelings and realities of a given place and time? Of course, it's not new to suggest that space is an active constituent in social meaning and values, nor is it bold to contend that spaces do not have static, singular or spontaneous meanings, but rather it is in the interactions between people, things and the material space that lived experience is forged. However, in the context of the history of madness and, and its sanctioned civic spaces, place has a particularly pockmarked history. This is witnessed not least in the segregative spirit that's characterised much of the past 200 or so years of psychiatric practice, but also more casually in the metaphors of madness that dust our everyday speech. One is round the twist, in a dark place, gone do lally, out of your tree. Moreover, research with survivors, service users, and those with a mental illness diagnosis also reveals that space and journeying a dominant modes of narrating our experiences of pain, despair, joy, and anguish. However, while institutional spaces have played front and center in the big narratives of psychiatric history, less room overall has been given to both patients' experiences of sites and also the, the interrelations between these places and their wider social and political milieus. This paper, uh, turns, though, to a third dropped stitch in the knit of this story, culture. How have artists captured and communicated psychiatric spaces? And what kinds of evidence can we gather from their work to help forge more creative and humane alternatives to current practices? It's my contention that the three artists examined collectively seek to redistribute the terms and structures of knowledge and power in relation to psychiatric treatment spaces and they thereby take vital steps towards making sure that we all have a place and a safe place to be. So Frederick Wiseman's 1967 documentary, Titticut Follies, Joe Penhall's 2000 play, Blue Orange, and the vacuum cleaner, AKA James Ledbetter, who's based here at Arts Admin, his live art practices, including The Ship of Fools, Mental and Mad Love, form the focus. The works span two countries, 47 years, and at least three aesthetic practices, 
not to mention radical shifts in the history, policy and approaches within formal psychiatric care. The works in some ways map messily onto the broad brushstrokes of these latter movements. So if Titicut holds asylum life in filmic suspension, then blue-orange captures a form of hospital bureaucratic managerialism in ASPIC, while Ledvitter's projects intervene in the contemporary values um, and shapes of community care, or so-called community care. Moreover, in key manners, the works shudder in political unison. The works share thematic preoccupations with human expression, with power, authority, knowledge, voice, and perhaps most importantly, shame. All three artists question what it means to care, what constitutes a community, and how far the political capacity to be heard is conditioned through interlocking authoritative discourses. Briefly taking each artist in turn, this paper will sketch the ways in which the works politically engage with spaces of madness and cultures of harm. The paper will argue that through aesthetic means, the three attempt to redistribute the locus of knowledge about madness, widen the aperture of perceptual realities, and decenter the question of where to put madness. In their interrogations of space and place, they provoke new and I think vital considerations as to what a hospitable community of support might actually feel like. So, snapshot one. Frederick Wiseman was a key figure in the direct cinema movement in America in the 1960s and 70s. Wiseman adopted the practices of a stripped-back form of cinematic framing. As Gillian Smith summarises, um, none of Wiseman's films include interviews, music or voiceover, no narration, no external method of explanation, no Edward Murrow essays to launch us off or catch us when we land. The films are intensive exercises in location. Sound and lighting are found, never supplied. And Wiseman's starting impetus to make Didicut Follies was to educate the trainee prosecutors he was teaching at the Boston University Law School about where they were potentially sending their clients. Filmed at Bridgewater State Hospital in 1966 with the permission of the then superintendent Charles Gowan, the film offers a fragmented vision of institutional life. And after some initial screenings in New York in 68, the film was stopped in its tracks and the state of Massachusetts fought and won a legal battle to have the film banned on grounds of breach of contract and inmates' right to privacy. Revealingly, some of the staff also launched claims that their privacy had been breached, insofar as it was not always clear who was a patient and who was staff. The original case ordered not only that the film be banned, but that it must also be permanently destroyed. Wiseman, thankfully, uh, successfully appealed this and saved the negatives from the furnace. And the ruling was decisively overturned in 1991. And the film was first aired um, on PBS, uh, the American TV channel PBS, in September 92, and on the BBC in March 93. In his summary of the case, the judge said of Wiseman, quote, he abused the privilege of making the film showing identifiable inmates naked or in other embarrassing situations, end quote. And I think what's particularly striking here is the locus of shame in tandem with the distribution of knowledge. The ruling tacitly suggests that the inevitable gaze of viewers is one of pity. Viewer and viewed are thus caught in a mutual and reciprocal act of shame and shaming. The act of looking and the captured behaviors are what are cast as shameful here, as opposed to the structures that produce such spectacular conditions of despair and degradation. So the film's um, excessive nudity is a problem of gaze rather than of sy uh, systemic routine abuse. This is not to suggest that there are no questions of consent here at stake for the institutionally looked upon into each bodies. However, I think what's vital to apprehend is how far the judge's summary relies on an already agreed social script regarding the shameful nature of madness for shame we ought to look away. A paradoxical dignity is presumed conferred by turning away from their life. And what is more, it is then kept in its proper private place. 
It's the contention of this paper, however, that in fact the film's refusal to tidy away or metaphorically clothe madness actually serves to, um, to create its critique, its searing critique of the asylum system. Perhaps the most remarked upon scene from Titical Follies is the force feeding of a naked, emaciated patient by a smoking doctor whose fag ash teeters nonchalantly over the funnel of liquid. The passive man is called a veteran by the doctor and praised for being a very good patient, very nice, and the staff joke that he should chew his food. The still picture of his resigned body in this scene is only disrupted by his convulsively shuddering throat. It's an unremarkable hospital scene. And Wiseman intercuts the feeding with shots of the same man being embalmed and placed in the morgue. So the editing here allows the earlier stillness of the man's body to be visually echoed in his final stillness. And Wiseman thereby creates a living ghost and one that accuses us all in his passing. The camera viewpoint positions us in the feeding circle surrounding the man. And through this, we as viewers exchange glances with the other men. We too stand by and do nothing. Indeed, throughout the film, there are numerous scenes of people watching, watching things, people, procedures, always reminding us of our own act of looking. And one has to question, I think, how our gaze is being constructed in relation to such pain, should we look away? Should we look away later as another naked man is bullied by his staff about the cleanliness of his room until he is so agitated that all he can do is stomp his feet over and over and over and over? Should we look away then? Titty Cut Follies makes no effort to normalize or soften in its childlike willingness to stare, it could even be presumed rude. Furthermore, in its uh, rejection of contextual information, it risks homogenizing its subjects. And while there remains a problem, I think, of making bodies speak through the documentary frame, a position which is particularly acute for an already over-observed and over-deciphered population, Wiseman's apparent refusal to make these men be anything other than what they are, I think is certainly a political gesture. Further, as Raymond Williams has suggested, there are in fact no masses, only ways of seeing people as masses. <coughs> so Wiseman offers a doubled frame, one that perceives individuals within a system of mass. And these are edited realities, of course, but I think Wiseman is steadfast on our behalf in his refusal to look away. In this way, we're invited into a more complex, but perhaps more radical gazing contract with mental alterity. By remaining within the frame, Wiseman's complex subjects broaden the aperture of human experience. Moreover, by zeroing in on the men's lived experiences in the hospital, Wiseman redirects our gaze from bureaucracy and architecture, which tends to be the focus in histories of sign and life, to the bodies that matter. Snapshot two. Joe Penhold's play, Blue Orange, was first staged um, at the National Theatre in 2000. It's been performed extensively to critical acclaim in both the UK and across North America. Blue Orange portrays the intellectual and egotistical battle between two psychiatrists, Bruce and Robert, over the diagnosis and discharge of service user Christopher. Thematically, the play gestures towards the overrepresentation of African and Caribbean men in the British mental health services, as well as staging debates around cultural relativism. The sparse set is comprised of a transparent water cooler and a glass bowl containing three oranges. And there is scant action. Three men sit, stand, talk. The original production, this isn't the original one, um, the original production at the Cottesloe had rake seating on four sides as if to evoke a boxing ring. Language spars create the architecture of psychiatry here. In this densely verbal play, we witness Christopher being folded away inside sheets of language, dwarfed as his psychiatrist's balloon. While Christopher is the ostensible focus, in fact, he is frequently lost in the psychiatric fray. Indeed, he's often sent off stage during discussions such as this. 
As the play progresses, Christopher's footing in the discussions swirling above, at, and about him becomes precarious. He says, I don't know what to think anymore. When I do think it's not my thoughts, it's not my voice when I talk, you tell me who I am. In this way, the play dramatises the precarity of psychiatric discourse. However, there's a further dynamic of scripting that takes place that I think returns us interestingly to Titicut Follies and language as a core disciplinary strategy in psychiatry's armoury. As I mentioned, there's a brutalising sequence in Titicut Follies in which a naked man, Jim, is taken from his cell to be shaved, roughly, before being returned and locked once more in his room. In the course of a three and a half minute sequence, the guards ask Jim almost 20 times if his room will be tidy tomorrow. In the same three minutes, they ask Jim to repeat himself or speak up over 26 times. It's an uncomplicated picture of grotesque bullying. In the opening act of Blue Orange, Christopher is asked eight questions about why he can no longer drink Coke four about why he can no longer drink alcohol, two about coffee, and at one point told not to walk too much, quote, you must try and control it. Now the point here is not that these scenes are interchangeable, nor is it to suggest that perhaps in Christopher's case it might not be a good idea to cut back on caffeine. Rather, it's to direct attention towards the performance of power and the persistence in the line of questioning in both pieces. As Ariel Watson points out, too often doctor-patient dialogue is in fact not dialogue at all, but learning the right words to say until the right answer is given, the scripts followed, the roles taken up. One watches here, then, a performance of hospital citizenship in which compliance is the hinge on which being a good patient turns. Repetition functions, then, I think, as a form of performative coercion, and Penhall's acute interrogation of language makes audible the grinding refrains of rusted power. If Titty Cut Follies was immovably located, quite heavy in its specificity, Blue Orange Cats uh, cuts an altogether more capricious shape. It's both somewhere a London hospital and nowhere a discursive anteroom. By placing locatedness in recession, and foregrounding language as place, Penhall quietly exposes how far rhetoric can obscure lived realities. As the two psychiatrists fight over where to put Christopher, it becomes apparent that in fact there is nowhere to go. There is no place for him. On the one hand, they say, we don't have the beds. So Christopher cannot stay where Bruce argues he should be. On the other hand, the community to which Robert wishes to send Christopher is hardly what one might call uh, caring. Christopher says, I don't have a home, uh, I don't have any friends. QPR supporters with bananas pissing through the letterbox fires, fire starting on the doorstep. Thus, while the diagnostic arguments clatter on, what gets lost in the chatter is any sense of what home, place, care, safety might actually mean. Indeed, the single request that Christopher makes um, to help him find some peace at night is rebuffed out of hand. Quote, well, you know, Chris, I can't provide you with double glazing. It's not part of my remit. If you want double glazing, go to the council. In all the sound and fury, then, what evaporates, Penhall argues, is the capacity to hear when someone tells you what they need. Snapshot three. It's late spring 2011. James Ledbitter is struggling. He is depressed, anxious, and suicidal. As he wryly jokes in his later performance piece, Mental, about this period, quote, my yearly cycle of getting ill is upon me, or spring, as you call it. Reluctant to be admitted to a psychiatric ward, James, with the help of his friends and, quote, a fucking brilliant mental health lawyer, decides and manages instead to write his own mental health act and detain himself on its terms in his own flat. His previous experiences of admission have been more, quote, more traumatic than my already mentally distressed state. The Ship of Fools, then, was at, at heart an, an attempt to navigate a creative route through profound distress as an antidote to toxic hospitalisation. In the course of his 28-day section, he was visited by 12 people. Together with Ledbetter, they made a range of creative works that would later be part of a touring exhibition. 
The artworks range from short films to customised t-shirts with messages such as I went mental and all I got was this lousy t-shirt and psychiatrists tried to make me go to the nut house and I said no, no, no. Um, one arresting element of the project I think is how far the principles of community are nested within the creative responses to distress. Moreover, community functions in triplicate in this work. There is the internal dialogic making community of the artists in residence with Ledbetter who talk and walk and make. This collective though are tucked inside a wider community that is engaged by the creative interventions in public shared spaces. From painting Paradise Lost on the letterbox of a cherished closed down calf to writing um, Barking Mad on a tree trunk or your enthusiasm on a curb in a marker pen. The community is a core aspect of the methodology. Further, the project's museum afterlife allows the hospitable embrace of others to extend to a much wider us. Community is not a fluffy conceptual ideal here, nor am I suggesting that the Ship of Fools argues straightforwardly for a model of community-based support. Rather, I'm arguing that the dialogic relationships that it establishes between self and others and objects and geographies precisely invites us not only to think about what community means, but also what it feels like, how it's enacted, and perhaps most importantly, what it can do. Community here shifts from being a spatialized notion to a relational and emotional one. And it's important to know how far Ledbetter's work renders the politics of emotions newly legitimate in ways that remain bold in the context of some mental health care practices. The Ship of Fools kept Ledbetter alive and out of hospital. However, he um, explained that it placed a great deal of strain on his friendships during the period owing to the levels of support that they'd offered. And following the project, he had an email from someone else in pain asking if he could recreate the process for him to help him get through. This exchange in turn helped nurture the seeds of what would emerge as Ledbetter's current initiative, Magla, a designer asylum, which is a creative research process aimed to reimagine acute psychiatric inpatient spaces. The Magla project to date has comprised a series of workshops in Britain um, that have principally examined the following questions. What does good mental health feel like? What does good mental health care look, feel, taste, smell, sound like? And if you could design your own asylum, what would it be like? A pilot installation that responded to the initial findings was presented at FACT in Liverpool as part of the Group Therapy Mental Distress in a Digital Age exhibition. And more recently as part of the Bedlam exhibition at the Wellcome Trust. In the next stage of the project, we'll examine the logistics and processes uh, involved in running such an environment. Here, Ledbetter and his participants will ask such key questions as, how are decisions made in this environment? Who is this space for? Who facilitates this space and how? And the final outcome will be a temporary hospital that will run as a day unit uh, for six weeks in 2019. Madlove's principal aim to find an alternative to acute inpatient care is not a new idea, but it remains an urgent one. Influenced by the thinking of Paolo Freire, led me to ask the question, how do you formalise mutual care while still dissolving power? Indeed, the principle of Madlove is a bottom-up, patient-led, horizontal process of research and knowledge exchange. Ledbetter's decentered, wide-angle lens approach then widens the horizon of perceptual realities and thinking as to what constitutes not only good support and treatment, but what constitutes good mental states. In this way, through the redistribution of knowledge, Ledbetter, I think, is steadily digging a fertile space for alternative categories of political life and structures of support. And while this may, may sound utopic, it's difficult to imagine a project that seeks to radically reimagine the horizons of what is thinkable that is not willfully optimistic, especially when one's opponent is orthodox psychiatry. Furthermore, while Ledbetter's unequivocal aim is to have a direct le legacy on the actual lived conditions and structures of mental health care and support, he's not unaware that a holographic room and feral cats may not always make the final edit. It's like Vivian Westwood, he says, you wouldn't wear it, but you're inspired by it and incorporate some of it into your life. 
led by its foregrounding of emotions, sensations and bodies as at the heart of political life in the context of psychiatry, is a bold invitation to change not just the packaging, but the feeling and lived experience of care. The move away from a predominantly segregative system of mental health care since the 60s is incomplete. While many hospitals and asylums have closed or been repurposed as luxury gated communities where you now pay for the privilege to stay inside, and hundreds of thousands of patients have been dispatched into the community, it's abundantly clear that we do not have an adequate understanding of what community <coughs> means or how it's produced. Nor has there been a dismantling of the invisible walls of segregation enacted by ghettoization, surveillance, and social marginalization. As Andrew Skull has suggested, altering the packaging of care is insufficient if it is not enacted in tandem with a sustained and radical engagement with the lived experiences of madness, detention, and care. And art, of course, does not have all the answers, but vitally, I don't think psychiatry does either. There's tireless important work <coughs> taking place across hospitals, day units, GP surgeries, drop-in centres and elsewhere with psych staff battling to meet the needs of their patients. <coughs> but in order to reform care practices so that they meet people's needs without coercion, disempowerment and punishment being commonly felt responses to treatment, it's evident that we need to find new ways to listen to the voices of patients and redistribute knowledge, power and expertise in different ways. The three works under discussion in this paper cumulatively expose the persistence of key themes in the harmful experiences of psychiatric space, autonomy, language, knowledge, emotion. Collectively, these works shift the focus away from the bricks and bureaucracy and towards the bodies and behaviours housed therein. If Titty Cup Follies interrogates how we see difference, then Penhall's work critiques how we speak difference, and Ledbetter's practice explores how we feel difference. For all three artists, however, there is a tacit invitation to expand our thinking with regard to the parameters of personhood, perception, inpatient care and community. These artists, when heard in unison, urge that we need new structures of thought through which to understand, value and hold emotions, bodies and experiences. And it's only through a horizontal confluence of voices that having a place and a safe place to be will emerge as a possibility for us all.